-hmm. Okay. So, hello everybody. So today I will present uh, this work about using the finite difference time domain method for the analysis of moving bodies. I'm Professor Halim Boutayeb, and Mohamed Marasti is a PhD student who recently joined uh, our research group. He started uh, his PhD thesis uh, last year, actually in May 2022. And he started to work on the subject that we will present today uh, in about September 2022. But actually, uh, this work has a longer history. Uh, I start to read a lot about electromagnetism and the moving bodies uh, during my PhD thesis uh, 20 years ago. And at that time, I asked myself many questions. And uh, uh, I think that with the work we did with Mohammed, he did a very excellent work uh, with the uh, FDTD uh, for moving bodies. I think uh, this responded to some of the question I had. Uh, I hope you will like uh, this work and I hope you will find it useful. So this is my research group. Uh, I have presently five PhD students, two postdoctoral fellows and three master thesis students. Uh, they all joined my research group recently because I'm a professor since only 2020. 2020. And uh, so all of them, they join less than one year and a half. This is our research activities. We work on time writing web guides, uh, theoretical and numerical analysis of electromagnetics with moving structure. And this is a subject of this presentation. 180 degree angular millimeter wave beam steering antennas, uh, orbital angular momentum antennas. We also work on massive MIMO using quad port antennas, the effect of rain in E-band communication systems, intelligent repetitive surfaces, and RF energy harvesting. The Silicon Valley of Canada is located, located in Ottawa, and it's called Kanata North. There is of over 23,000 uh, work in the park and about 500 companies. And this is where actually I live. And I used to work at, uh, in this uh, research park as a research engineer, an antenna research engineer for almost nine years before I joined uh, the University of Quebec on Ottawa as a professor. The University of Quebec on the is about 20 minutes from the Canada North, Canada Research Park. And at that university, we have the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, where we, there is about 10 professors in computer science and 10 professors in electrical engineer, engineering or photonics. The UCO is located in Gatineau, Gat and uh, this is a uh, some information about the University of Quebec on the way. And Gatineau, you are very welcome to come visit us. Uh, we have many uh, festivals uh, during all the seasons, uh, summer, uh, uh, spring or winter, as you can see in these beautiful photos. So this is the outline of this presentation. First, we will have an introduction, then we talk about numerical aspects, then we present problems with moving observer, source, or sparking objects. Then we have talk about the metallic slab moving, the michelson moly interferometer, the Sarniak effect, Compton experiment, and every side faster than light analysis. And then we will have the conclusion. So let's start with the introduction. The analysis of electric problems with moving object has many applications like radio frequency Doppler radars, astrophysics, GPS, electromagnetic optical gyroscopes. It has been an important subject of interest for a long time. Numerous investigations have been carried out in this area, which is interesting from a practical and theoretical point of view. In 1887, uh, Voldemort Volt, uh, 
wrote this paper called on the Doppler, the, on the principle of Doppler. And in this paper, he considered the wave equation and he considered actually the wave equation with the moving observer. This is, for example, for 1D, this is a 1D wave equation for a moving observer, which we can call the convective wave equation. In that paper, Boyd wanted to, to, to change the form of this wave equation to the more common wave equation, which is for an um, um, observer at rest. Why he did that, he was actually trying to find uh, an explanation of Michelson experiment, which has been done in 1881. And he tried to find actually a new formula of the Doppler effect in order to explain the, 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 the result of this experiment. Actually, in another paper, he gave an explanation of the, uh, that, uh, that experiment, but later on, he retracted and he found that the, he said that there was an error in his uh, demonstration. But anyway, in this uh, paper, he take the convective wave equation, convective wave equation, and he say, I can write it like this, with a new variable x prime and t prime. And this new variable, by calculation, he will find that they, they, they can be writing like this. So this set of equation is the same as this wave equation. In void paper, actually, he doesn't distinguish, he doesn't say either this wave equation is for, is for electric wave or for sound. It can be for electric wave or it can be for sound. If it's for sound, then C is, will be the speed of sound. A will be the pressure, and so it will be longitudinal wave. And if it is for electric wave, C will be the, the, the speed of light and A will be for the, uh, the transversal wave. In 3D, he also can want to write the, his convective wave equation in the form of a, a classical wave equation for no motion. And he can do that if he can use, if he introduce this, this auxiliary variables. So this variables, it's a, just a change of variables. And uh, we have this factor here, gamma, which we find in this two parameter, y prime and z prime. Andrew Locks, uh, Andrew uh, Lawrence uh, wrote many papers between 1892 and 1904 related to electromagnetism and with the moving uh, objects or moving our bodies. Like this one, La Théorie électromagnétique de Maxwell et son, son application au corps mouvement. Uh, this one, Attempt of Theory of Electrical and Optical Phenomena in Moving Bodies. The Relative Motion of the Earth and Ether. Then Simplified Theory of Electrical and Optical Phenomena in Moving System. And Electromagnetic uh, Phenomena in a system moving with any velocity smaller than that of light. Lowens adopted Volt auxiliary variables and he used them in Maxwell equation. And actually he found many results that helped to support Maxwell electronic means with the, the result that Lowens obtained uh, Maxwell equation were uh, more accepted. Uh, let's see why. He actually he analyzed uh, different phenomena. In this paper from 1894, a tent of a theory of electrical optical phenomena, he used void variables, as you can see here. When he introduced this in Maxwell equation, he will also uh, transform the fields, like the electric field and magnetic field will be uh, changed. When he used the uh, void variables in the wave function, as you can see here. First, you introduce that you introduce the t prime x prime, and you do some uh, algebra to put everything that is factor of t or everything the factor of x to have the, the the new frequency and the new wave uh, number or propagation constant. So from that, he can find the Doppler shift just by using the void variable. 
he also he was also able to uh, able to uh, uh, to find the stellar aberration, as you can see in this equation, and also the FISO experiment, which which is uh, an experiment where we have a uh, moving water, and uh, the motion of the water will change the speed of propagation uh, uh, of light. And this experiment has been done actually in the 19th century. And uh, FISO by, uh, sorry, Lawrence, by using voids, the variables, he was able to find the new speed of, uh, speed of propagation of the light in the moving medium. And he actually obtained a formula at low speed, which is the same as the Fresnel formula. Fresnel got this formula in the 18th century by uh, 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 by using the concept of the moving, uh, partially moving ether. So it's a drag effect. But in uh, uh, Lawrence's work, actually, he was able to find the same formula, but with a non-moving ether, with an immobile, immobile ether. In 1904, Lawrence wrote another paper, electronic phonema in a system, moving with any velocity smaller than that of light. He, he used again void variables, but he multiplied with gamma. As you can see the gamma, so we don't have the gamma anymore with, with the y prime and z prime. And we, now we have the gamma in t prime and x prime. The gamma factor actually uh, was useful in order to account for left contra length contraction hypothesis to explain the michelson moly experiment. We will come back to make some michelson moly experiment later. And also it, it accounts for the apparent increase of the electron mass in Kaufman experiment in practical accelerator. The finite difference time dominator is based on the discretization of Maxwell equation in time and space. This are Maxwell equation in a isotropic medium with the constructive parameter of the medium, so permeability, uh, connectivity, and permittivity, the electric field and magnetic field. In Cartier's and coordinates, we will have six scalar equation, partial differential equation, and then that we can discretize in uh, space and time. The finite difference of the different equation uh, using with the error of order two are uh, given by this formula here. This is the E cell. This is uh, based on the E cell that we can uh, uh, resolve the, the finite difference of the six equation that we have here. This is an, an example of uh, equation that is used to, uh, to update the, the, magnetic, the, uh, the magnetic field component. This is the algorithm of E that was proposed in 1966. So he has to define the special mesh and the time step initialization, and then we have iteration in time. We can calculate the electric field component from the previous magnetic field component and previous electric field component. The same thing for the magnetic field component. And then we have a time loop here. It is important to note that there is no any approximate, physical approximation in the resolution of Maxwell equation by using the finite difference time domain method. There is a, a problem with the concept of change of reference frame. And this is what we saw before. And that's actually the, what the void law and transformation is doing. We change from a one reference frame to another reference frame. And the change from one reference frame to the another reference frame is done by changing the, uh, the, uh, the space parameter and the time parameter. But this, this actually is limited to object moving at uniform speed. We cannot consider a problem with the rotating, accelerating, or oscillating objects. It cannot be used for multiple objects moving at different speeds because you, you, you modify the, the space and time variables uh, as a function of a speed. But if you have different objects moving at different speeds, then you cannot uh, modify them. Uh, 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 yeah. the same thing for the actually the electric field the magnetic component you will, you will change them only for one velocity 
And also another problem is the moving objects are not very visualized. For example, the Minkowski space-time diagram. When you look at this uh, diagram, you don't see it's supposed to, to 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 represent something moving, but you don't see an object moving. So the objective of this work is to analyze moving bodies with LTD method without the implementation of void Lorentz transformation. And we have to analyze the result and compare them with the relativistic result, which the relativistic are considered as a reference. And also we want to analyze new problems or get top 10 and see we have new results. So let's start with the numerical aspect. We consider a windowed, window, windowed uh, sign for excitation signal. Uh, and that's how you will see here. Of course, we cannot consider a, a infinite, uh, a, a, a sinusoid with infinite time. We, this cannot be simulated. So we have to make it finite. At the same time, using a sinusoid with a, with an, with a, has a bulge like this will give us in the, for, for, in, the, in the frequency domain a very good frequency, as you can see here. And this is useful if there is a Doppler effect, we will see the frequency change based on the, that solution. So this is an exit excitation signal that is going to be used. The FDTD dispersion equation is very well known. And here we plot the dispersion as a function uh, for a certain parameter of the uh, mesh. And actually, something we're going to use later is we can make the wave at the higher frequency to move at lower speed by playing with this dispersion equation. Here we talk about discontinuous motion. The blue line that we see here is a continuous motion. If something is moving, this is a position, this is time. Something is moving with uniform speed, it will follow the blue curve here. So x0 plus vt. But because we are moving in the discretized space, the motion in FDTD is what we see the black curve here. We can uh, approximate this black curve with the red curve. And that approximation is what we wrote here with A sinus omega g t. And omega g is a function of the mesh and the uh, time, uh, uh, time step. So the discontinuous motion has an effect if we, for example, if we move the uh, plane wave source, we will get here this effect you will see. So we can see the Doppler effect. So the, the plane wave source is moving in this direction. So we can see here higher frequency and lower frequency here due to the Doppler effect. And also we can see something here, which is undesirable waves. And it's propagating at lower speed because it's, it is happening at higher frequency. And by using the dispersion equation, we, we, make, we made this wave propagating at lower speed. And this one is, uh, is not desirable. So based on the analytical equation that we have here, we can find what is the analytical formula for this wave. And we can see that we, they are uh, at, uh, at uh, the frequency related to uh, the omega, um, omega G and also at the harmonics. And if we, if we, look, we see here the signal in time, in time domain, we have the desirable signal, the one what it is, which is due to the uh, uniform, uniformly moving uh, plane wave source. And that one is due to the uh, discretization in FDTD, so undesirable effect. We find that if we use two plane, uh, plane wave source, now moving in the same direction, and based on that equation here, we, we found that we can cancel actually, or mitigate, reduce a, a lot the non-desirable effect that we, see, we have seen before. So now we, have, we see here only the Doppler effect. So higher frequency, lower frequency. And this is observation form. This is where we measure this signal that we see. The space mesh and the time step. 
So the pulse action frequency that we pulse action frequency that we said before the omega t, it needs to be larger than the maximum pulse action frequency considered uh, omega max. From uh, empirical analysis, we found that omega d should be at least uh, uh, smaller than two omega the max. And from this, uh, after some uh, algebra, we found that delta x should be smaller than 0.5 v over f max. So v is a speed of motion, and we can see for low, very low, uh, for very low, for low speed, we need the delta x to be very small. And if we have to reduce delta x, we have also to reduce delta t based on the stability criteria. So based on the, the previous analysis that we said, we have plotted here the number of iteration, iteration the number of cells. Mfix, Mfix is a number of uh, uh, iteration that is needed without motion. So we have a wave that is propagating at the speed of light, c, and we have an object moving at speed v. And uh, for, in order to, to make the object moving for, for a certain number of uh, iteration, the object is not moving and then move one cell to the other cell. So M fix is a number of iteration without motion. So we can see that for low, uh, when we decrease V, we have to increase the number of iteration, the number of cells and M fix a lot. So this is uh, some kind of limitation. Uh, considering very, very low speed means we need a lot of iteration, uh, no, a lot of cells. So uh, this will need a lot of uh, uh, computational time, so simulation is is we call very time consuming. If we analyze the numerical nodes, so the, the the effect due to the discontinuous motion, actually is not uh, increasing, is not changing as a function of v. Uh, as long with we have that that uh, the because we have this, uh, we have changed delta t and delta x, so this time where the the the, the object is not moving, is, is fixed. Sorry, Sorry the MFX, MFX, multi, the, multi, yeah, yeah, this is time is fixed, right? yeah. So is there any other solution to, 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 to modelize moving object at lower speed uh, without moving from one cell to other, the other cell? Uh, the other solution will be to use the Holland thin wire formulas. We can have a wire that is inside a cell and uh, uh, it can be any position in the cell. Uh, this can be a solution to modelize something with moving pretty uh, low speed. Or we can use moving the, uh, the idea that is proposed in this paper about moving dilated interface. So basically they change the value of the epsilon where we have the NTFS in order to modelize the effect of the position of the NTFS. So now we talk about the moving observer, moving source, and moving scattering objects. We will see in the result that we present that uh, many of the results that we present are for V, which is in the order of C. So we, uh, high speed, we can say high speed. Uh, so why we why it is still correct to do this so, and why we do, we're doing so, is because low speed problem will be time consuming. The comparison of numerical results with analytical formula, when we uh, analyze a problem. Uh, and we plot the result has a function of v over c, then we will have the behavior has a function of v over c, and we can compare with the formula. And if we want to compare with the formula, we have to do it for low speed and high speed. Also, considering high speed is better for visualization. If you move very slowly, you will not see, almost not see any effect. So high, uh, considering higher speed, is uh, helps to see to have a better visualization of the Doppler effect. Another thing is any any uh, problem that we have to consider in reality. So, for example, something is moving at certain speed v. If we do an analysis at very uh, much higher speed, and we 
understand uh, what the uh, what's effect in terms of v of c then we will understand what would be the effect at lower speed so in uh, the so with the with the 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 method that we propose, we will be able to analyze problem with rotating, accelerating, and oscillating object. We can consider multiple objects moving at different speeds. And uh, it is important to note that most electromagnetic problems are not relativistic. So except for particle accelerator, uh, the, we can, the, the, all the other problems in electromagnetism with moving structure, uh, they are non-relativistic. So let's define also a benchmark. We will see actually that the gamma factor play uh, an important role. We remember the gamma factor, uh, which is actually uh, Lorentz multiply the gamma factor to the void uh, variables. And we will see that actually it plays a an important role in the Doppler effect for the moving of server and also for the moving source. So let's analyze the gamma factor as a function of V over C. So you can see, so for zero, gamma is one, and then we increase here. What we can see is the gamma becomes more than one, more than 10% of one after zero point V over C equals 0 0.516. Before that, it's only less than 10% compared to one. So it's 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 not uh, it's, it's it doesn't have a, a, a big effect. We can like, they neglect the gamma factor up to ten percent effect, and after the, the zero point four one six, then gamma factor will have more and more effect. So here we will define this benchmark and say that when we have lower we are lower than this value, uh, the realistic effect can be neglected and they cannot be neglected when we are higher than this value. So let's consider now the moving observation point. Uh, so he should have a T here for Lorentz. So here we have a moving observer. And here we have a plane wave and the source is not moving. So there is no Doppler effect, as you can see, just the wave propagating like this. And here you have a moving observer moving in this direction. So depending on the value of B over C, so if there is no motion, you will get this signal. If there is motion, you will get the different signal that you will see here. So for V over C, we call 0 0.6, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, et cetera, et cetera. If you analyze, so E prime is at T, is the electric field that is measured for the moving observer. For example, this one here, V over C equals 0 0.2. Actually, we can, we, we can see that it is the same as the electric field that we observe, observe without motion, but where we will have to change the T here. So we have to multiply T with this one. For example, we can, we can consider this point here and this point here. So for a certain t, if we multiply by one plus b over c and we take here 0 0.2, we will find the value of e prime, uh, e prime uh, z at t, at a certain t. And this solution actually, it's all, all the Doppler effect is on that equation because you can take the Fourier transform of this and you have just a, a function of multiply a function of a multiplied by t and if you do the Fourier transform you will see everybody has done this calculation you will see how the amplitude of change and how there is the frequency will be shifted actually this parameter here has an analogy with what is called the Lorentz slot time you remember the t prime of void which is T of plus minus x of v of a c a c square. If we take x equal to c t, we can write it like this. So they are similar. So in LDTD, the local time is uh, the Doppler effect in time domain. Here, this is a spectrum. So 
this signal here, if we do the Fourier transform, we will get this curves here in the frequency domain. So what we see is the frequency is changing due to the Doppler effect that we have seen here in the time domain. And the amplitude is changing based on the Fourier transform of function of a t. And a is this coefficient here. Now, if we plot the Doppler effect, so f prime over f, f prime is a new frequency due to the motion, and f, the frequency without motion, we will find that it is in agreement with the one plus b over c, which is the classical Doppler effect for moving observer. And also, we can do move the observer with a certain angle, and we will get one plus b over c cosmic theta. And this is amplitude, which varies in as opposite to the frequency. If we compare this formula that we obtain with the FDTD with the relativistic formula, so the relativistic formula has a gamma factor. It's gamma multiplied one plus B over C. We can still use our FDTD technique and get with the, the same formula as a relativistic formula by modifying. The, the electric field that it, it is uh, observed. And we can do this modification. So the modification will be to take the electric field observed, multiply by here to the gamma t. And we will now have a, another signal. So do, by doing post-processing of the electric field measured, we will get a new electric field. And this new electric field actually will have the same Doppler effect has relativistic has given by the relativistic formula. Here we are moving uh, uh, a plane wave source. We say ideal because it is made of current sources, and uh, it is uh, it doesn't reflect or it doesn't absorb any wave. Uh, here the plane wave source is moving in this direction, so this is why you see the frequency increasing here and the frequency lower here. If we look to the amplitude, we, we will see something interesting. If you remember when we saw, saw the moving observer, the amplitude in time domain here, the intensity was always the same. We didn't have any change in the amplitude. Here for the moving source, the more you increase the speed, the more you see the, the, the amplitude is increasing. And it will become infinite for v over c equal one. We propose actually a more realistic plane wave source. Instead of using current sources, we use current sources and resistor. And this resistor will have this value. So eta zero over two eta zero is uh, interesting impedance of uh, free space. So one to one t p ohm. If we use this uh, plane wave source, and we do the same analysis, we will find that there is no increase in the amplitude in time domain. And this is more uh, in agreement with the, uh, uh, this is uh, this makes more sense actually. And this is in agreement with the moving observer. During my PhD thesis, I actually work on the, the fabri pedal cavity excited from inside. I, I got a similar problem about the ideal or matched plane wave source. Here, if we, we excite a fabric pillow cavity made of uh, partially reflecting surface with here metallic wires, we have multiple reflection. So first transmitted wave is uh, T, and then we have reflection T R square, exponential minus G K 2D, etc. If you add all of them, you will get this formula. And if you look to the amplitude, you will have at the maximum, we'll have this formula. At the maximum, you have one if you have no absorption. Now, if you excite the fabric cavity from, from inside, you do the same analysis in terms of metric reflection, you will get a formula when the maximum here actually is not one, it's more than one, and minimum is given here. And this is due simply by, by the fact that. This plane wave source is ideal. If we 
consider um, matched plan wave source, we will not have this uh, amplification. If we use a plan wave source with another uh, input impedance, then we can analyze the, the, the power transmitted, but we have to normalize by the power available by, from the source. So this analysis has been presented in this work here. So in this paper, in this work, we have seen that the ideal plan wave source will show increasing field. And uh, every site in this paper in 1888 is analyzing a moving charge. And at that time, when I uh, during my PhD thesis, when I read that the, the, his electric field was increasing with the speed, I thought that maybe it is it has a there is a relation with what I was doing here. And this is only later on that I, I we found that yes, moving a uh, plan uh, moving match at plan wave source doesn't have an, an amplification of the intensity of the field. And that's why we think that this work should be reanalyzed. So it should be revisited. And probably if we consider um, a charge that has a certain um, input impedance, so and we consider that it's matched to free space, we should not see this increase of the electric field. In his paper of 1905, Albert Einstein, uh, he wrote this, from this equation, it appears that for an observer, which moves with the velocity C towards the source of light, the source should appear infinitely intense. So he has the same uh, result and then uh, 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 every side, but actually he got it for moving source and moving observer. This is a photo. This is an image I took from internet, and this is actually what we should see, and this is what we see in the LED. The moving source doesn't change intensity; it change only the frequency. And in LED, this is what we get exactly if we consider that source is much to free space. We don't see an increase of the intensity; we see a change of the frequency. And this is why we think that the analysis done by Einstein should be revisited by considering a uh, uh, realistic uh, source and match it play, uh, source. We also analyze uh, what is the speed of propagation when the, uh, the plane wave source is moving. So remember when we, when we have the plane wave source moving, we can analyze what's the, the speed we have for different V over C. And we found actually in the FDTD that it is independent. We always have the propagation is always C, independent of the speed of source. And this is in agreement with what Einstein uh, called as his second postulate in his 1905 paper. Light is always propagating with a definite velocity C, which is independent of the state of motion of the emitting body. This is uh, the spectrum for the moving plane wave source. Uh, this is uh, for the, uh, the match at the actual plane wave source. And this is how the, the amplitude is, cha is, 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 is uh, changing with, the, uh, with different V over C and the frequency, how the frequency is shifted. And if we measure the result from the LTD, we got this Doppler effect. So F1 over F will be one over one minus V over C. And the amplitude vary as opposite. The relativistic formula is given by this. So what is missing in our formula is gamma minus one. We can uh, implement and get the, the relative, uh, the same as relative formula if we change the source, the moving, the 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 the, the, the signal of the moving so, uh, moving source. So if we apply this, so. The EZ for source modified will be EZ source for here gamma minus one t. If we do this, so it's easy to implement. And the advantage of our work is we can have move, uh, many moving sources uh, um, moving at different speeds, and we can still have the realistic effect of the, uh, the complete problem.
Here, we consider a, uh, a, a moving partially reflective surface, which is made of metallic wires, and it is moving here in this direction. And we analyze the Doppler effect, and this is a result from LDTD, and this is the analytical formula. So in this analytical formula, actually, we can understand it from that has a, the Doppler effect from a moving source and Doppler effect from moving observer, because the reflector is first it is an observer for the wave coming. So it's the observer of the wave coming, and then it becomes a source of the wave reflected. And this is why we will get this kind of Doppler effect formula. This uh, uh, formula is well known uh, on the wave with classical wave theory. And uh, the special theory of relativity actually get the same formula for the moving mirror. So here we don't need to do any uh, change or any modification to get the relativistic, the relativistic formula. Here in this uh, problem, uh, we consider a moving uh, inclined partially reflective surface. And as you will see, if it doesn't move, it's, if it's, if it's, uh, the PRS is at 45 degrees, the beam coming here at zero degree will be reflected at 90 degree. If there is motion, it will be reflected at a different angle, so depending on the velocity. So we analyze the angle of reflection as a function of B over C, and they are, they are in agreement with this formula here. So depending if it is moving in uh, plus V or minus V, so in this plus X direction or minus X direction, we will have the, the different formula, so alpha 1 and alpha 2. Alpha B, which, that, which we plot here, this is for comparison. Alpha B is actually the broadly stellar aberration that we found in um, 1729. This is, for example, if the, the plane wave source is inclined and it has a, a beam at a certain angle, if, in, if it's moving, then the observer will see it at another, at another angle. And that's the angle given by broadly stellar aberration. This is effect that we see uh, uh, when we see light coming from, uh, 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 from a star. About the alpha one and alpha two, actually mirror, uh, Michelson and Lawrence, they obtain similar results. And uh, they, they obtain the result by using Huygens principles and the primary principles of this time. For the moving inclined pyrus, we derive this formula of the Doppler effect. And here we show for different angle, all this, it, it, it fits very well with the FDTD. And the formula actually can be, can be uh, obtained uh, easily, rapidly, as we can see. Here we see a moving line source and it's moving at a certain speed. So for example, 0 0.4, as I said, if we take 0 0.4, then we can see we can see clearly the Doppler effect here. And so you see the wavelengths are smaller here and the higher here. And the wavelengths that we find here is in agreement with the wavelengths that we that we get for a moving plane wave source. So we will have one over one minus p over c for the the, the, the Doppler effect from a moving source. And here at the 90 degree, we have no Doppler effect. If we want to have the relativistic Doppler effect, we just have to add the, the we just have to add it in the frequency of the source. Here we see a, a metallic wire eliminated by a plane wave. And what's interesting is we also see the Doppler effect, as we see here. And something else is this wave that here. here. We analyzed a lot of this uh, result, and we found that this waves here they are not function of the discretization, so they are not function of the, the time step and special mesh. You remember that before we talked about the effect of discontinuous motion, and uh, this effect they are they change when we change the uh, time step, time step, and uh, space mesh. But here it doesn't change because 
it's not a function of the discretization. And the angle actually of these waves, they change with the velocity. We call these waves elect electromagnetic shock waves. Uh, and electromagnetic shock waves actually is something uh, that is well known in, uh, in electromagnetism, but it has not been analyzed with such problems. In order to see the electromagnetic shock waves uh, uh, with a better visualization, we consider, for example, an electric static field that we see here in red. So, and we move a metallic wire. The motion of the metallic wire will change the field, as we see here. And there is this cone of the shock waves, as you can see here, depending on the velocity. Here we did uh, some. Uh, Experiment so analysis in the FDTD of the this angle. We also analyze a moving inclined uh, interface, a dielectric interface, half space uh, with oblique plane wave, and uh, this is the angle of the reflection and angle of transmission for different V of the C and for different index of the material, the dielectric material. This is a Doppler effect and the amplitude changing has a function of the V of the C and for different index N. This is for the reflection, so it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't change. It, it will be always the same uh, and it, it will be independent of the index N. And this is for the transmission. So for different index N, we have different Doppler frequency shift and different amplitude. We derive analytical formulas based on this result. Here we consider uh, um, uh, a moving uh, um, uh, moving slab. So moving dielectric slab. So a moving dielectric slab because it has a certain uh, width, we will have multiple friction between the interface. And this is what we see here in, in uh, blue here. So this one is a slab at rest. And, uh, the, and here is the interface at rest. So you have multiple friction. This is what you use. That's why you see the resonance. A certain frequency, you have full transmission and a certain frequency, you have reflection. And we also did this analysis for moving slabs. So the, the, the orange here is for moving slab, and that curve here is for moving interface at uh, moving interface. And uh, the same thing for other realities. Here we have three moving slabs, and we compare with the moving uh, interface. So if I have three moving slabs, you will see that blue curves that we see here. So it's it's a combination of the of the fields coming from the, the, the different uh, reflection from the, the the slabs, and that's why actually it's it, we can relate that to the curve that we obtain for the interface, as you see here. Here we see a moving um, dielectric uh, cylinder. And we can recognize the Doppler effect. Here we have wheel-tip cylinder moving at different speeds. That's very interesting. And here for three cylinder, one moving, for example, is a minus 0 0.3 with the other one 0 and the other one 0 0.5, we will get this kind of blue curve which we can relate actually to the moving interface when we compare. We, 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 um, we normalize the amplitude in order to have a better comparison, but we can see that we can see the effect of the different velocity. This is, uh, this is a result very interesting because uh, we think that we, it should be possible to, uh, to modelize uh, the motion of, um, of, of, of um, uh, Many objects moving at at random speed, and we should be modelize should be able to modelize uh, black body radiation. Uh, maybe for maybe we can modelize the motion um, 
using, uh, for example, Maxwell uh, Boltzmann uh, uh, distribution of the velocities. This is uh, some ideas of the utilization of this of uh, the FDTD with the multiple object moving at random speeds. Here we see the result for the moving dilated half space. So for different speeds and different dilated constant. Here we see a, a, a metallic plate, plate that is oscillating. So this is something we can do also in the LTD. And we obtain results that are very meaningful. The, 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 the frequency of the oscillation actually uh, will make this kind of spectrum. And uh, so depending on the frequency of the oscillation and uh, the frequency of the wave, we will have this kind of uh, peaks and uh, with harmonics and, uh, and intermodulation of the different frequencies. Here we have a rotating line source, and we can also observe the, uh, in the, sp uh, the spect frequency spectrum uh, frequency that are related to intermodulation and uh, harmonics. Here we have a rotating line source around an observer and uh, there is no Doppler shift to this problem. We can also have a rotating observation point. We can also analyze accelerating ob uh, objects. For example, an accelerating ob observer. We will get this kind of curve if it's accelerating towards x or if it's accelerating towards minus x. So for the first case, we see the frequency decreasing and the other case, um, if, um, um, yeah, one should be frequency decreasing and the other one frequency increasing. Yeah, the other one frequency increasing. And this is what we call, uh, there's this kind of uh, cheap uh, signals, which are very well known with increasing frequency or decreasing frequency. This is what we see for moving plane wave source. So you see the frequency here decreasing, uh, increasing, and here the frequency decreases. So if we consider an ideal plane wave source, we see the amplitude increasing a lot, like with a constant uh, cost, uh, increasing. But if we, we look to the, the accelerating match at the plane wave source, the, the amplitude doesn't change. Here we see an accelerating parcelated in surface. So now we will talk about uh, the moving metallic slab because we found interesting results that I'm going to present now. So you see a moving metallic slab. And what's surprising is, so we have the reflected wave with a higher frequency and you can see there is another wave transmitted on the other side. We don't see this wave if the metallic slab doesn't move. See again, so there is no electric field inside, and then there is a transferred wave on the other side. If you look to the magnetic field distribution, there is a static magnetic field. See here, there's a static magnetic field, and then after that, this after the, when they reach each reach this magnetic field, there is a, a electromagnetic wave on the other side. So this result is very surprising. At first, we thought that maybe it would be uh, a numerical issue, but we, uh, we analyzed this problem with using perfect electrical conductor or conductor with high uh, uh, conductivity, and we obtain the same result. And what's interesting is we can analyze analytically this, uh, the, 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 this field. And this is what we have done here. This is a result for the transmitted, uh, for the reflected wave. And this is FTD result for the transferred wave. So what we found is the reflected wave will follow this formula here, 